Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Farzan uh, Badi uh, from Digital Medusa, and uh, today we are going to talk about algorithm transparency, and we are going to workshop a workshop. So we are going to ask you for your feedback and ask you to do some work with us. Um, so uh, we have Nick Souser here that uh, we are going to set the scene with Nick and uh, talk about like what transparency actually means. And then uh, we are going to have a presentation on life of a query uh, with Zoe and, and Charles there. And so I'm just going to introduce Nick. Uh, Nick uh, researches the regulation of network society. He is a professor at the law school at Queensland University of Technology. And uh, he has many more affiliations, and, <laughs> and he's an award-winning educator. He has loads of medals, and uh, one day he will probably get an Internet Governance Medal. Um, but he has worked on various Internet governance issues uh, relate, uh, through ac across the Internet stack. Um, so uh, I always say in these transparency conversations that uh, if we don't know what we want, uh, the, uh, what we want out of the transparency conversation and what the purpose is, then we end up uh, not getting what we want, and that we also is something that we need to clarify. Who what do we mean by we? And as academics say, we might end up transparency washing the whole issue. So today we are going to be very objective. We are going to um, uh, we are going to talk about algorithmic uh, transparency by going through life of a query and have a discussion about how algorithms work in search engines. We also discuss why we are asking for transparency of algorithms and then also who we are in the first place. Uh, it's not an existential question as such. Uh, we mean like users and researchers and civil society and policy makers. We also discuss some good examples of algorithm tra transparency and what we mean by transparency and, uh, and a kind of ex explainability of algorithms. Uh, in a nutshell, we aim to contextualize AI. Oh, I said that word. <laughs> uh, we, need to, uh, con we are going to contextualize uh, algorithmic transparency, and uh, we would like to also have your feedback on the life of the query presentation uh, to make it better and streamline it for uh, policymakers, researchers, and other stakeholder groups. So now uh, I pass it on to Nick to tell us more. Hey, thank you, and good to see everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I'm, I'm actually really keen. I haven't seen this workshop, so I will be uh, experiencing it with you and we're going to uh, find out whether it answers all of the questions that we have uh, around transparency. Um, so this is, this is a pretty big, it's become a big buzzword, uh, transparency, but it's taken us a long time to get here. Um, when, when I started in this work, I guess transparency reporting was, uh, was just starting really around government requests and uh, copyright requests, mainly because, you know, some search engines got sick of how many copyright notices they were getting and created a scheme to lodge those copyright notices with Chilling Effects Clearinghouse. And it's used, it was used for, from the very start as a way to push back against influence from either state actors or from private actors. Um, so it's no surprise that the next big transparency reporting movement was about the right to be forgotten after the European uh, decisions we required Google and other search engines to remove content. Um, that was a there was all of a sudden another big chunk of data that was made transparent. All right. The problem is I don't think any of us really spent enough time specifying who transparency was for and what they actually wanted to do with it. You can think of at least two audiences, right? The individual, the person who's been affected by a decision once presumably, we hear this a lot, to know 
Um, why am I seeing what I saw? Why, why is this ad targeted at me? Why are these query results different from my, my friends? Whatever it is. That's a, I, I think about this more as a notice, more as an individual procedural aspect of transparency. When I think about how we use transparency or how we might use transparency as a tool to drive greater accountability, that's not the audience, I think, that at least I have in mind. Um, the tools that people, realistically, when we're talking about decisions made at the sort of scale that we're talking about, whether that's Google, whether that's any other company, that is continuously making small scale decisions in continuously changing environments with continuously changing software that's being A-B tested continuously, that's being updated according to continuous changes in the world, transparency about one particular decision is basically meaningless. And one of the big flaws, I think, I am impressed with how far we've gotten on transparency reporting. Um, the, the Santa Clara principles uh, um, and have now come up with the second draft of the Santa Clara principles and we saw many more companies sign up um, to, to provide voluntarily information about content moderation problems. Now we're seeing more government mandated transparency. All this information is going somewhere and I don't know where it comes out. Um, because one of the big challenges is, the, from my perspective, the information goes in without context. So you can know that 100,000 pieces of material were removed under a hate speech policy. But what does that tell you? You have no idea what that means if you don't know the denominator, like how many pieces were actually uploaded, what, how, and you have no idea what it means if you don't know the error rate. How certain are you about these particular decisions? More than that, if you accept what I said this morning, which is there are going to be power differentials that are evident in these processes, that they will impact some communities much more than others, then you don't know, that number doesn't tell you anything if you don't know the distribution of errors, of false positives and false negatives in that data. That's what we don't have. It's what we've never been able to get because of primarily of um, privacy concerns. The, the, the moves after Cambridge Analytica in particular to lock down APIs really worked to prevent researchers and civil society from getting access to the types of thick contextualized data that would be required to answer some of the questions that people actually care about. You know, am I being targeted? Are these, is this subset of people getting significantly different job ads? Whatever those questions are, they're never answered by how many job ads did you serve? You always need thicker information. So that I think is where we are now when you've got debates about the algorithm um, you have concerns about ranking and curation um, in addition to concerns about takedown and, and leave ups. And you see Twitter release the algorithm, right? And it's a couple of pages of code and it tells you again, very little. You don't get the weights, you don't get the information about um, what they regard as most important, you just get the mathematical formula for feeding those signals in and extracting out a prioritized list. So what I'm hoping that we will be able to do today is uh, in this workshop, I think improve the level of sophistication that we use when we're civil society, government players, talking about transparency, talking about um, particularly algorithmic transparency I think it's, a, it's incumbent on us here to really particularize what that means. What do you want and how are you going to deal with the privacy concerns if you want live actual human data, um, which is still basically an unsolved problem. And what, what sampling techniques, what other bits of the pipeline you might need 
which so it's not just decisions but we want now we want training data or what training sets what training data on what date um, at the oversight board we've been trying to think through some of these questions and I'm I'm stuck I'm stuck because I don't know where the next logical step is in terms of what is the next um, tranche slice of uh, information that we would need to be able to hold these systems to account. And I think, you know, I have some ideas um, that what we really need is uh, particularly a more task focused, rather than trying to understand an entire system as it exists at one particular point in time, developing a set of metrics, a set of measures that you're concerned about and reporting on those continuously in a way that gives us, you know, information that we can build on to better understand how a system is evolving. Um, but there are other, you know, really big challenges. The Like getting me to shut up, it's a big, big challenge. <laughs> so I will do that now. And hopefully, <laughs> Zoe's gonna fix the, all of this for us. Thank you so much, Nick. And Nick is always such a tough act to follow. So I was encouraging people to actually come up because you'll be doing a couple of activities. If you wanna do those on your lap, that's also fine. But you have two post-it notes. So the first thing that we're gonna do, actually, you know what? The first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you an example of what we've tried to do um, to give in-product algorithmic transparency. So I want someone to raise their hand and um, shout out a query, anything that you want me to search for. Keep it clean. Joyband? Jordan. Jordan. That's a good example. Could it be Michael Jordan? Could it be Jordan the country? Let's see. Okay. I'm from Chicago, so we, we think of Michael Jordan, but. Uh, here we go. So um, one of the things that we have here are these three dots. You can click on these three dots. This is called about this result. So the first layer of about this result tells you one thing. It tells you, A, is this personalized or is this not personalized for me? Then the second thing it shows you, well, it shows you lots of things, but I'm gonna only show you two things because we have a limited amount of time. It shows you um, this piece of what we call search literacy. That why do we not call this algorithmic transparency? We don't call it algorithmic transparency because how do you, in, thi in, in, in this limited l number of strings, actually give algorithmic transparency to billions of people for every single query? So what we've done here is our best to show you what, your, what uh, is your search in this result. And what we found after doing some uh, limited diary studies, small sample size, is that people's mental models change after they see why, um, why a certain search result is appearing to them. So here, what we're telling you is the search is not personalized and that the reason you're seeing uh, Nikes is because um, the search term appears in the result, Jordan. And this has images also related to your search. And then there are other websites with your search terms that are linking to this result, and the result is in English. But you can see on the rest of the search results page, some people aren't searching for Nike. Some people are searching for the country. Uh, here I, uh, are also some, uh, some results clearly relating to the fact that, uh, that, that search knows that I am here at IGF in Tokyo and giving me some uh, results in, in Japanese, even though my search is in English. All right, so that is uh, one way that we've been giving uh, in-product transparency. Now let's talk about why this is so complicated to do. So um, what we're gonna do, actually Charles, do you mind advancing for me? Do you mind? Is that, is that okay? Um, so our agenda today is we're gonna do some welcome and introductions. So I want you to take your first post-it note, write your name, it's PII, so totally optional guys, you can opt in. Write your name, write your organization, and then complete the sentence, to me, algorithmic transparency means dot, dot, dot. And then give me one sentence. I'm gonna give you 45 seconds to complete this. And then um, Charles is gonna come around with a board and we're gonna collect all those answers. After we're done with that, uh, I'm gonna go through 
<laughs> a very abbreviated, caveat, very abbreviated version of the same training that we give to all new search engineers and product managers. Normally, this training is two days. We lock you in a room. We teach you everything uh, from front end, front end engineering to back end engineering. We don't have the luxury of that time. So we're going to do this in about 30 minutes. And what we want to hear from you afterwards is what works. We've never given this workshop before. What works? What doesn't work? Is this a good enough baseline then to have a deeper conversation about algorithmic transparency? Because a lot of times it stays at the 10,000 foot level. Uh, and then uh, after that, we, we can have some Q&A. So all right, as you are uh, finishing your, uh, your first exercise, uh, we have another group activity because I told you you were going to draw. So take your second piece of Post-it, trademark, 3M. My copyright person is in the room here, so I'll give all due credit to our colleagues at 3M. Take your second Post-it and draw your mental model of how a search engine works. How do you think a search engine works? You do not have to be a good artist, but you have to be great at internet governance. <laughs> okay, we'll set a timer for 60 seconds. And when you're done, you can come up here put your intro on the board here, and then put your mental model of a search engine on the board over here. I'm going to linger over the Google employee. No, no, let's do it, Kate. Draw, draw, draw. So we did have one question about how a search is not personalized to you, but in English and recognizing that I'm in Japan. And so um, that is not personalized to me because everyone in a certain course and location area and is in searching in that language which I chose, which was English, is getting the same results. There's nothing specific to me uh, about that result being shown. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Customized but not personalized. You know, a uh, great one is soccer. In the U.S., we're going to give you, or sorry, football. In the U.S., we're going to give you that game played by the best athlete ever, Walter Payton, Chicago Bears. But in England, we'll give you that game played by, thank you, Jim, David Beckham. I couldn't even think of one. <laughs> All right, so when you're done, Please uh, put your post-it on the boards. <laughs> they don't have to be perfect.
I bet when you signed up for our Algorithmic Transparency Day Zero workshop, you didn't realize it was going to be an art class. Okay, so what I see here from what algorithmic transparency means to people are a bunch of different responses. So making visible the way that algorithms work, knowing why a result is showing up when I, I think that, oh, uh, provide an input. Uh, to me, algorithmic transparency means openly knowing the quality and biases of data sets that feed the algorithm, a way to understand why and how your experience on a service is influenced or displayed or organized or shaped. To me, algorithmic transparency means being able to understand how the results are output from the algorithm. So lots of different things. Very hard to display on a screen about this big. So how do we actually do algorithmic transparency? Um, on the other side here, we've got some amazing grade A art that I'm gonna make NFTs out of, become very rich, quit Google. Um, but I think, uh, I think Charles is gonna try to show what some of you art majors drew. Uh, there are a lot of squiggly lines, but my particular favorite one here, I'll just describe it to you, says user, arrow, query, arrow, magic, with asterisks, arrow, and then results. Uh, and we do talk a lot about Google Magic, but it shouldn't be necessarily so mystifying that it feels like magic all the time. So hopefully, maybe you guys can see some of this. I encourage you to come up afterwards to take a look at uh, all of your contributions. So this is how search actually works. We drew it kind of like a vending machine. Uh, and so here, if you can think of you in front of the search results page, that's like the vending machine. And then that is the what we call front end, what the user sees and experiences. And then back behind, this is the Google magic, you've got uh, natural language processing and query understanding. You've got crawling because you gotta find all those web pages. You've got data retrieval. Once you've crawled, how do you go get something from that index? And then you have all of the web pages, which here we are pretending to be soda cans. So um, let's build together Gurgle, the search engine for the thirsty. Uh, and so we are going to use this lovely vending machine to really quickly go over how uh, search actually works. So the first step when you're building Gurgle is you have to find as many drinks as possible. Uh, and so to do that, you have to crawl. And so how would you find as many drink options as possible in the world? So returning to our trusty vending machine, this is where we are at the process. We used to have this as a spider web and my very, very senior software engineer said, that's gross, Zoe, you're gonna gross people out that they're gonna think spiders are in their soda. So now it's a shopping cart. Um, and if I were to ask you to find as many drink options as humanly possible, you might come up with 10, 20, 15. Uh, but in one day, uh, we at Google are able to crawl millions and millions of pages. So, group question, anybody can shout out, no drawing involved, just raise your hand. If you were gonna start crawling and building your search engine, where would you start? How would you start crawling? Perhaps the, yeah, like surrounding me. Okay. Great, past searches. Anybody else? Where would you start? Crawling the web? DNS, okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Fars at the juice bar. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, this is kind of content specific, so I'm probably trying to feed it something that was content specific. So maybe a magazine or something that was specifically about beverages, because that's what we're looking at. So I'd start from there, and then maybe, or maybe a blogs or something about the topic. So those are all great answers. Uh, they're all correct answers. And this was also sort of a trick question, because you can start anywhere. Uh, with the web, once you get to a few links away from any other page, you're basically able to get to other, uh, other pages. And eventually, you're able to index quite a crawl and index a large proportion of the World Wide Web. All right. So um, next, we are going to swiftly go through crawling and talk about indexing. So once we have all of our drink options, what do we do next? Uh, you have to organize all of them. Next one. Great. So now uh, we have all of our cans, uh, and we're here in the data backends. This is the inside of our vending machine, and it's rows and columns of drinks organized perfectly. But they're not organized when we get them, right? Because if we're having a Pepsi, and then the next person says, oh, I like Coke, and then the next person says, oh, soda's bad for you, I only drink seltzer water from La Croix, then eventually you're going to get a collection of drinks, but they're not going to be well organized. So indexing is what actually organizes the content that we found. Uh, and so I'll skip over a lot of this because I think, oh, actually, sorry. So uh, before we go on to serving, what do you think it's important to put in your index for each drink? What would you want to know about the drink? Color, nutritional value, price. Is it artificial? Or is it organic? <laughs> the result is not sponsored, Jim. It is organic. Uh, anything else that you would want to know? Is it alcoholic? That's a good one. Past recalls. <laughs> Do I really want to drink this poison drink? Yeah. Um, great. So. In this analogy, this is kind of what we're doing with pages. We want to know what is the page about. We read the metadata, find out what the title of the page is. We kind of group it. Uh, are, they, are these pages all about soda? Or all the, are all of these pages all about seltzer water? Or are all of these pages about uh, alcoholic beverages of the type that hopefully we're all going to enjoy later? Great, 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 amazing, search engineer here. So we have uh, how many reviews, how many people have been talking about this particular drink? Similarly, how many people are linking to it? Uh, that's a signal that we can use, although that's also a signal that can be gamed pretty easily um, through fake links. All right, so then let's go on to serving. All right, so we've made it now to the part of the vending machine that provides the drink we asked for. So now that we have all of our drinks indexed, we can serve the user the results that they'd like based on their query. But the computer inside the machine is registering your input and helping you find what you want. But in a search engine, this looks a bit different. While a vending machine is responding to an alphanumeric code that matches exactly one drink, you want a Mountain Dew, I don't know why. You want a Mountain Dew, you press the Mountain Dew button. But for a search engine, you have to take your query and match it with annotations of index pages. So is it uh, about a drink that's 24 ounces? Is it alcoholic or non-alcoholic? All those things that we mentioned before. And then the claw here is doing the data retrieval. It's getting our drink and depositing in the tray. So let's take a specific query here. 
So this query is soda. And without any additional context, when someone puts in the word soda, what do you think that they would want? Kate wants a fizzy drink. What else? Okay. Uh, Nick is baking some delicious cake and wants baking soda. Anything else? Okay, most people aren't even looking for soda. They would call it pop or soft bev soft drink, yeah. Um, yeah, so it really depends on where you are. So that is why we do use course and location, for example, to try to do that query understanding. So for example, my favorite example of this is Super Trooper. Am I gonna age myself? Please tell me somebody knows. S anybody? Super Trooper? Super Trooper. Okay. It's an ABBA song. So most people searching for Super Trooper are looking for ABBA. But ABBA actually named their song after a type of light. So if you are a Broadway lighting designer, you may actually be looking for a specific type of stage light. And so synonyms are one of the things that are really hard for us and actually started before all of this AI, before Gen AI, before all of this, we really were starting with uh, synonyms. And so if you have one person looking for pop and one person looking for baking soda, what are the type of signals that we should be using? You kind of got there already. How do you know if somebody wants a drink or baking soda? Location, previous search, somebody wants personalization. Time of day, also a good one, yep. Habits, so what I'm hearing is that actually some personalization would be really useful in some cases to understand the difference between what somebody is looking for. But we actually don't personalize a ton on the search results page at the moment. The amount of personalization changes over time. Uh, so what we try to do is actually use uh, uh, advancements in language understanding and query understanding. So the signals are the bits of information that help us understand its relevance to a query. And this can be about how recent a page is. So for a query like SOTA, that may not be as important. Um, another signal that we may use is the location of the word. Is the word soda the title of the page? That might make us think it's more about soda. Is the word soda down there on the third paragraph penultimate uh, sentence may not actually be as relevant. So those are the types of signals that we use. And they help us uh, get as close to what we call user intent as possible. But we don't actually have a set weighting system for queries. And I think this is what's really hard when people say, I want algorithmic transparency from you, Google. You need to tell me the exact you know, A, B, C, D, and E for how you're returning results. Because it's dynamic and it changes over time. So can anyone give me an example of where uh, something like freshness might be important? A query where you might want something more. Game scores, great example. If you are searching for um, I'm trying to think of soccer teams uh, to be to draw a connection with you all, but it's, it's eluding me. Arsenal versus Chelsea. Oh, thank God. Arsenal versus Chelsea. You want the game that was played last night and not the game that was played last week. Uh, what about you, Jim? You said time of day. Where, what's, a type of, uh, what's a type of query where time of day might be more important? Weather. Right. What's the temperature going to be? Because if, if you're searching in the morning, you might want to know uh, earlier. Elections, for elections you'd want something fresher, right? The elections that are happening sooner. Yeah, these are all great examples. 
or the, yep, or the actual result. Great. So for newsy types of queries, freshness is more important. For other types of more stable queries, like hair braiding, I tried to, I, I failed, but I tried to braid my hair today. Uh, if you look that up, you, you may not need the latest hairstyle, uh, and so freshness might not be as important. All right, so you guys gave us all sorts of great signals that we could use, and if we used only those, one thing that we would miss is spam. So the reason that these calls for algorithmic transparency get complicated really fast is because we are constantly in an adversarial space with about 40 billion pieces of spam a day. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So I am almost done. So despite everything, uh, search is a total work in process. We are always launching huge updates sometimes to core ranking, to small tune-ups, to make sure that we're giving the right soda at the right time, uh, all designed to make search work better so that we can find the most relevant, highest quality results as possible. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is page quality because that's one thing we haven't really talked about. And that's actually one thing that's very important in discussions about algorithmic transparency. How are you actually rating what the quality of the page is to determine how the highest quality results can float to the top? It is not magic. It's actually through a combination of hundreds of algorithms, <laughs> at least, plus on top of that, our search quality rater program. So we do use humans not to rate individual pages, but to take a sample and to say, your systems are working as intended here, they're not working as intended there. And so our page quality is summed up by the acronym EEAT, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And so I think a lot of people want algorithmic transparency to be like, step into this closet, show me the code, I will know how it works. But actually, we've been really transparent about this and put it in a 160-page document on how we understand page quality. How many of you have read the Search Quality Rater Guidelines? Bars gets a free drink at the bar. Kate gets a free drink at the bar. That is what we consider to be a huge effort towards algorithmic transparency because it tells you exactly what our biases are. Our biases are for high page quality and ex experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Um, but people I know are busy. They don't have time, like FARS, to... It was a research project. It was her job. Uh, to read 160 pages. But a lot of times, based on what we saw you guys put up for what you want algorithmic transparency to be, it really is about reading 160 pages about what a company says they are biased towards in terms of quality. Um, but I think what people really want is something simpler, something easier, like the about this result feature that we showed at the beginning. So thank you very much for indulging me. Thank you for your art that was amazing and it really, really good. Uh, and I'm going to throw it back to Fars and Nick uh, so that we can have a discussion with the rest of our time. Thanks. So uh, when you're looking at uh, page quality for rankings, and this is horizontally across time, if you look at the kind of, um, let's say, advertising uh, that is coming in and a lot of the search links becoming uh, you know, uh, oriented towards gaming the Google algorithm, as you rightly said, and the quality of uh, content on the web itself degenerates. How do you handle that? I mean, your quality of uh, results will uh, drop because the quality of content on the web is gamed towards selling and not towards the kind of internet you saw in the early 2010s or 2012s. And it's a gender, general uh, user's uh, perspective, but happy to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, that's the heart of it. How do you, uh, because it is super adversarial, and if people know, okay, the moment people realized it was about how many links <laughs> are linking your page, then everybody was just like linking to their own pages, right? 
Um, and now I think what you're talking about is the what's often called the SEOification of uh, of web results. I think the other thing here is a lot a, a shift in the information ecosystem where a lot of content creation is happening more in uh, in in hosted content platforms or you know walled gardens. And so if people are incentivized to interact either in a platform, a closed platform, or a chat group, or whatever, uh, they're not uh, creating on the open web. And so I think there is a larger ecosystem question to be had about how do we incent do we want to incentivize, and also how do we incentivize content creation uh, in the golden age of the internet when I grew up in the 90s when I had an X file, maybe more than one X files uh, page hosted on Lycos and AngelFire. So yeah, good, great question. Any other questions? Um, the words uh, personalization and customization, uh, are they used like, uh, do you use it interchangeably? Like for me, if I give an example, I'm not a soccer person or a cricket person, whereas my husband is that. So if I search about football or cricket, some things will come up, which is like more preliminary things about cricket, like this is cricket, this is football. But if my husband searches, it will be more of the advanced uh, source of search results. So do you call this personalization or customization? I mean, Zoe might answer that, but I, I would think of that as personalization. If you, if the system knows enough about you to know that you don't know much about cricket, um, then that's a personalized result and the changes are personalized, but. Yeah, the way we think about personalization is it's, is it something unique to you? Is it your search history? Is it because, you know, something about your past searches seem to imply that you're a cricket person over a soccer person. That, to us, is personalization. The, that's why we say location, course and location, doesn't matter if I'm searching in Queens for best pizza near me, everybody else is gonna get the same result. There's not something about me they don't know, as Google should, that I really like Soto La Stelle over, uh, over um, over do uh, Domino's, yeah. Um, and then Hi, John from the AI Foundation for the record. Um, so we were talking about um, potentially personalized results. I, we didn't see any example on the search that we did before, but if it was personalized, would the interface tell you how did they get to that conclusion? What was the process that it went through? So for right now, this particular feature doesn't say we know X, Y, and Z about you, and that's why it's person it says it's personalized or not. A good example of where a search might be personalized is for more like a feature like uh, what to watch, what to read, what to eat. Um, and so if you're searching for uh, a lot of recipes about cassoulet, maybe after a while and you have personalization on, that's the type of search where we might give you uh, Julia Child over, say, oh, who's that? Am I on the record? I won't say anything bad. Rachel Ray, for example. So you might want a higher quality cassoulet recipe if you're a true French chef connoisseur. I'm sure Rachel Ray's recipes are great. Depending on the Google search I do, I get a number of sponsored ads that come up first. And sometimes a whole page would be sponsored ads, like if it's a hotel. How did Google decide how many sponsors ads to show me before I get to the actual search? You've caught me out. I am a, an organic search person. We have people who work specifically on ads. There is a limit for the number of ads that you'll see on the top of the search results page. I won't give you the exact number because I'm gonna forget. I think it's something, Kate, do you know? Like only certain sets of queries. So if you're searching for a product or searching for a hotel, so certain queries 
will have more ads than other queries just because they are ones where people are kind of looking right to shop or to buy something or book a hotel etc um, and so it's different depending on the query yeah like for example the first query that you saw me show which was internet governance form there were no ads on that one but there are even for those that are more shopping journeys uh, there are a limits for for the number of ads that can be shown Hi, Enrique from the Brazilian Network Information Center. So, um, if you use an incognito uh, window, uh, Google still knows your location and uh, time of your search, but does not have uh, access to your history, search history, right? Could you use uh, the, the difference between the search, the incognito window, and the normal window as a as a measure of personalization you get on the search? I mean, you could, or you can just turn personalization off. So if you go into that, the three dots, it'll show you personalized for you or not personalized for you, and then there's a link that says manage my personalization settings. So even if you don't want to go into incognito, you can use that link to turn personalization on or off, and then it's, it's the same as comparing between an incognito window and a regular browser window. Um, Charlie Warzo po uh, published a, um, a piece recently about um, the fact that Google might be boosting uh, commercial queries. Uh, what and I, uh, what does transparency would look like to make that more publicly available if it's true? Great question. So I actually maybe what we'll do is pull up Charles. Do you mind pulling up Danny Sullivan's tweets on this? Because uh, our search liaison actually provided a public response and rebuttal because it was a very, uh, it was a misconception of how we would handle those queries. So there's not a magic Google fairy behind saying, uh, I tr put in the query Kate Sheeran, uh, but really in the back end, and we're not telling you we're putting in Kate Sheeran uh, um, Nike, for example. Yeah, go ahead. Let's say I didn't want to take your word for it. How would you demonstrate that to me? What sort of information would I need to answer that question? <laughs> Algorithmic transparency. Um, that's a really great question, Nick. And, you know, I would love to know what we can do beyond what we've already done <laughs> through in product transparency, through publishing 160 pages of search quality rater guidelines, through having Danny Sullivan put out regular tweets saying, no, we do not do X, Y, and Z. Uh, it, it would be interesting to know what we could do to show people that. Uh, if, if us saying it over and over and emphatically is not enough, then what, what can we do? Um, and that's why I made the joke, do we open a door and let people into the closet? Uh, I don't mean to be facetious, but I'm not really quite sure what is that thing that we can do to, to prove it. What about closed independent third party audits? Would that be a mechanism? That's a great question, Nick. Maybe since you're at the oversight board, you might want to answer about what you know of the DSA or some of the other content regulations about third party audits. I know that's one thing that the ecosystem is thinking about. Yeah, so I think it seems to me that in many cases, what you would want is someone you trust to have done a thorough audit of, of that code. So what do they need? You've got one of the problems of uh, who, how do we define the people that we trust? We can do that. We can sort of figure that out. How do we ensure that they that the personal information doesn't leak? Um, and you know, probably is part of, part of the same assurance process. You can figure that out. Then you 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 but you're pretty quickly like whittling down the pool of people that are going to be in a position to be able to do that. I think there's a, lo there's a lot of room for civil society organisations um, to work with journalists to provide that level of support, but we haven't, we haven't seen it because uh, typically we don't, ha we don't yet have those relationships between technology companies and journalists that would allow a technology company to be assured that it um, 
that the results were not going to be misconstrued, that the results would not re result in a leak of personal information, while at the same time allowing the journalists to actually publish what they want. Will the DSA fix that? Um, I, I'm happy to defer to other people in the room on that, um, but I do think that Fundamentally, what, you're, what you are probably looking for for systems accountability is some sort of external measure. I, I think you're probably right on this point that um, when, when Zoe says Google can provide you all of these assurances, you're not going to be satisfied usually until you've had someone actually go through and spend a, a whole heap of time understanding what's going on, which is pretty expensive. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Tom, I'm from New Zealand, so apologies for my accent in advance. Um, I'm project lead for something called the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency, and I think, um, just wanted to offer a couple of uh, observations. I do think the audit mechanisms under the Digital Services Act are gonna be something that is really important for effective transparency. I think the kinds of uh, materials that auditors can access are extremely detailed. Uh, if you look at a sort of laundry list for the different kinds of things you might want uh, from companies in order to provide meaningful transparency, the auditors essentially have access to all of those things. They can ask people questions, they can ask to look at models, uh, all these kinds of things. So I do think audit is gonna be a really important component of the DSA. I think probably the next conversation we might be having though, if we're relying on independent third party assessments is going to be how do we have any confidence in those assessments? So at IGF next year, we might be looking at the first round of DSA audit reports, but everybody will be saying, um, how do we know these are any good? and how do we know that the auditors have said the right things and seen the right things. So it's gonna be sort of an ongoing um, issue, I think, as to how we, we get this kind of transparency. I just wanna flag that one of the things we're thinking about as well is given that we have so much transparency information, and I think you're referring to that from a sort of Google perspective, the question of how people can effectively make use of that is a whole other question. And I think that's gonna require things like funding, for example, um, because having the time and the expertise to look into all of these things takes a lot of um, time and money, basically. So I think another component of meaningful transparency is going to be funding. And then I'll just call out one other thing, which is being able to find all of those disclosures in one place. So one thing we've heard through our conversations with various stakeholders is that it can be quite hard to find the information that's already being disclosed. So what we've tried to do is pull together a portal uh, that anybody can submit information to. Uh, it's called the Transparency Initiatives Portal. Uh, and the idea there is that we will try to have a useful piece of community infrastructure for accessing various kinds of transparency information and initiatives. So um, hopefully that will be something that we can talk about uh, in the future. Thanks so much. Any other questions? We have about five minutes left. If not, I'll pass back to Fars for closing thoughts. Yeah, uh, sure, thank you. I w when, I, when you were going through the presentation, I was thinking that for each of the step that you actually explained, um, there are sh like hundreds of algorithms are <laughs> involved. So I think, I, uh, so when we are asking for al algorithm transparency in that kind of context in the life of a query, what do we actually mean by that? We, uh, what, why are we asking for transparency in the first, this is why it's so important to know why we are asking for transparency to hold Google accountable or to do uh, or to do certain research and sometimes when we are asking for transparency we might actually want access to data and not necessarily uh, transparency in a, in a way that transparency and clear and uh, clarity in instruction so I think that's kind of like talking about transparency at granular uh, level might also help civil society and, and uh, policymakers um, 
with their effort to uh, govern um, uh, to govern the internet and search engine and Google. <laughs> so, and uh, so I think that this this was a, a useful exercise, but uh, I think that uh, like um, we need to provide more feedback uh, for like how to make this actually. Um, like how we can use this uh, example and uh, what more we, we need and want uh, uh, through these uh, processes to, um, in order to kind of feed into our conversations about internet governance in general. Do you have any closing remarks? Really? Why not? You were going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really keen to hear from those in the audience. Um, we don't have any more time now, but I invite you to write down on a post-it uh, and leave it with us because I think this is a really tough challenge, pitching this at exactly the right level. Do you want more detail? Do you want, do you want the two-day workshop version? Do you want something that is a little bit more technical but a smaller component? Um, or are you happy with the sort of level of abstraction for your own uses as, as advocates, as people in industry and government? other stakeholders, what would actually be useful? I think that's always the hardest part when you're uh, asking for information from a company that they've never given before. Um, their, their first um, impression of what might be, what you might be looking for is probably doesn't align with exactly what you need. So I think gathering that data, um, and if you want to write some feedback, we'd love to hear it, uh, would be incredibly, incredibly useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks. <laughs> well, we didn't. We didn't. Oh, don't. That's sad. Nobody. Oh, hi. Have